Oh, this is a Dr. Ben Davis. Uh, I think he blows things up. No. But you could. I used to blow things up. Yes, eh? I don't blow uh, things up anymore. And he's going to talk about what's real and what's not? Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds exciting. That's what you're here to learn, right? What's real? Is it going to be a test at the end? Uh, we could give a test at the end if you want <laughs> All right. I'll let you tell people about yourself because you have a lot of words on your screen. Okay. <laughs> so is everybody seeing my slide at this point with my bio on it? Oh, well, see, I, I want you guys to see the slides because I worked hard on these slides and, you know, it makes me kind of sad if you don't get to see them. Uh, I have a Ph.D. in nuclear physics and a master's degree in nuclear astrophysics. I do not do any of that anymore. I was college professor for a couple of years, and the way I always talk about that is a couple of years in, I decided that I like scotch. And the $28,000 a year they were paying me to be a professor just wouldn't let me buy the kind of scotch that I liked. So then I reinvented myself as a, as a uh, software developer, computer programmer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, made a little bit better money then, so now I drink scotch and program computers. And most recently, I, uh, I have gotten back into industrial control, so I build machines, conveyor systems and robots, and things like that. So kind of tout myself as sort of the, the uber technician at these things and kind of just feel like I can give good guidance on what's real and what's not, hence our talk today. So... With that, we'll jump in. Can you see my slide now? Okay. So I'm a skeptic. I bet you guess what my position on this is going to be. I'm actually, and this is a new, this is a new deal for me. I'm actually going to try to sit here and let them film me and do all this good stuff. I'm usually up and walking around and gesticulating and all this, all this crazy stuff. So it might get a little weird just me sitting here and not moving around. But we'll give it a shot. So you know. I, if you've ever been to a skeptic talk, every skeptic always starts off with the whole uh, burden of proof and proving a negative. And the reason why is I can't come up here and tell you ghosts don't exist, right? I can, but you'll go, well, well, what's your proof that ghosts don't exist? I don't have proof that ghosts don't exist. I can't prove something's not there, right? So that's why the burden of proof isn't on the skeptic and shouldn't be on the skeptic, should never be on the skeptic, and nobody should expect that. But we can sure talk about what we know, what we think we know, and we can see where the evidence is pointing. So I'll just read the highlighted section here. In some circumstances, it can be safely assumed that if a certain event had occurred, evidence of it could be discovered by qualified investigators. In such circumstances, it is perfectly reasonable to take the absence of proof of its occurrence as positive proof of its non-occurrence. Reasonable. It's reasonable to assume that. It's not proof, but it's reasonable. If, if somebody says there's ghosts, if somebody posits there's ghosts, and we've been going around for years hearing about this, and nobody's ever given us definitive evidence of it, then it's fair to say that they probably don't exist, and that's the best we can do. And that's the situation we're in. Put another way, Carl Sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And we certainly have not ever seen any extraordinary evidence. Blurry films, things like that. Lots of anecdotes and stories, but nobody's ever said, hey, if you go to this, this haunted house on Friday the 13th, you know, every time it happens, this apparition appears and anybody can go and see it. Kind of funny that it works that way. This slide I just, I just love. I have to throw this one up here for a minute. This kind of sums it up right here. You see the dog? Everybody see the slide? <clears throat> of course I believe in the power of barking. The only reason I'm alive today is because of barking. Every day a mailman approaches my home and every day I bark until he leaves. To this day he still has not brutally murdered my entire family. I have the power of barking to thank for that. I have a dog that absolutely believes this, right? He, you know, some neighbor walks down the street and he barks his little head off and the neighbor goes away and that obviously means that he did the right thing. And now my mouse is going to die on me. Don't do this to me. 
Okay. So, what are the pitfalls of mystical thinking? And you know, put another way, why do we care? Why are we talking about it? Uh, it does lead to a lot of mistakes in the way you lead your life, and a lot of things just you just can't enjoy life as much if you you buy into a bunch of BS. That's that's my attitude about it. Uh, you know, I've heard people say things like the following: there are, there are things that we simply you know as as mere human beings can't understand. To me, that's a license for ignorance, and I don't think anybody should should say, well, we just can't understand it, and therefore I'm not going to try to understand it. You know, if I think happy thoughts, the universe will give me everything I need. No. I tried, I spent a lot of years trying to think happy thoughts, and it still didn't get me fed. It still only got me a, a position of, as a professor that paid $28,000 a year and didn't, didn't bring my happy scotch to me. So I love this quote from Dennis Miller. <clears throat> Just one question here. How come the psychic hotline never told Dion Warwick that her career was going to hit the wall harder than Mr. Magoo playing High Lie? Uh, that's just that's classic you know she for those of you that aren't quite old enough she did all those commercials for the psychic high hotline you know back in the 80s and that was the last gig she got uh you know so <clears throat> her career did not go well after uh after uh, touting that so finally my observation to add to the mystical thinking idea is mathematically speaking there's 108 billion people that have ever lived before us that's just based on your nice exponential curve and 100,000 years of, of human history uh, there are seven billion of us on the planet right now that means six and a half percent of the people that ever lived are alive now should it really be that hard with 108 billion ghosts walking around for somebody to have seen one and actually be able to document it clearly that they've seen one. Take a picture, get somebody else to come along, talk to it, whatever. They ought to be all over the place. Especially in, in uh, places like New York, San Francisco, densely populated area. There ought to be more ghosts walking around than there are people walking around. That's just the truth of it. So, be happy but know that being smart and working hard gets you what you want. And... This is a picture of deep space taken by the Hubble telescope. Every dot you see in that picture is a galaxy, not a star, a galaxy. The universe is an interesting enough place all on its own that you don't have to make things up. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to worry about elves and Santa Claus and ghosts and astrology. If you really want to want to wander at something, there are plenty of things to wonder at. So the other reason why it matters. In the 1920s, Harry Houdini turned his energies toward debunking self-proclaimed psychics and mediums, a pursuit that would inspire and be followed by later stage magicians. Houdini's training in magic allowed him to expose frauds who had successfully fooled many scientists and academics. James Randi talks about how scientists and academics should pair up with magicians just so that they can get a better sense of how the human mind works and how you can convince yourself that something's true even when it's not. Uh, and I think he's right. Back to Harry Houdini, he was a member of the Scientific American Committee that offered a cash prize to any medium who could successfully demonstrate supernatural abilities. None were able to do so, and the prize was never collected. Does that sound familiar? Remember, this is in the 1920s. James Randi is doing the same thing, has been doing the same thing for 30 years, and nobody's been able to claim his million-dollar prize either. Houdini chronicled his debunking exploits in a book, A Magician Among the Spirits, uh, these activities cost Houdini the friendship of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle was a firm believer in spiritualism during his later years and refused to believe any of Houdini's exploits. Before Houdini died, 
he and his wife agreed that if Houdini found it possible to communicate after death, he would communicate the message Rosabelle believe, a secret code which they agreed to use. This was a phrase from a play in which Bess performed at a time the couple first met. Bess held yearly seances on Halloween for 10 years after Houdini's death. She did claim to have contact through author Ford in 1929 when Ford conveyed the secret code, but Bess later realized that it had been faked. In 1936, after a last unsuccessful seance on the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel, she put out the candle that she kept burning beside a photograph of Houdini since his death. In 1943, Bess said that 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. Fair enough. For me, the takeaway here is that Houdini and his beloved wife devoted a great deal of time, emotion, and energy, a.k.a. lost friendships, money set aside, heartbroken widow unable to move on, to debunking the mystics almost a hundred years ago. We've been here, done that. James Randi and Penn and Teller carry on this tradition even today. Much groundwork has been laid by professional showmen who have shown us time and time again that it's all tricks. How many times does it take to make the case? Now, this was one that jumped out at me when I first started down this road, the Amityville Horror. I'm at that age where, you know, this movie had a very big impact on me. I don't even remember details of it, probably because I blocked it out from my childhood. But I was sitting around watching uh, one of those crazy shows on the Discovery Channel a few years back, and they showed this picture of the demon boy you know, on the TV, and my wife was out of town. It was 11.30 at night. I was just sitting there by myself, and, you know, this picture, this, this creepy picture of this kid with the glowing eyes comes on the screen. It even, it even freaks me out a little bit, you know, being in the house by myself, and I'm going, that's, that's kind of weird. So when I started researching it, you know, I, I said, let's start with the Amityville Horror. I didn't know the facts. You know, it's like, what's going on here? Well... This picture is the best evidence they have, and it basically was when the investigators, the psychic investigators came and set up cameras throughout the house on timers. You know, this was back in the mid-70s, so people weren't real sophisticated as far as um, motion sensors and things like that. They just set, you know, time exposure cameras up and would just occasionally snap a picture and this picture got caught by one of the cameras, supposedly. And the best theory on this is it's actually one of the technicians who was probably setting up a camera when the, when the first camera, you know, snapped off. His name is Paul Bartz. Note the shirt and the hairstyle. This... And, and the reason the eyes are glowing is because it was done with infrared film. So you're literally seeing the, the blood flowing through the, his eyeballs and radiating heat. Uh, you know, so if anything, it proves the guy's alive, not dead. You know, because he's warm. He's 98.6 degrees. Um, but it, it definitely is a, uh, it's a compelling picture, or it was for me until I read up on it. The other thing about the Amityville Horror, let's see how we're doing on time here. We're actually ahead, so we're doing good. Uh, they touted it as a true story. There's a whole lot of players involved in this. Uh, basically, it started out with this fellow going, you know, nuts and killing off his family, and that really did happen. Uh, you know, crazy people do crazy things. And then... This, next fa this other family moves into the house. Those were the Lutzes, when we start reading through some of this stuff. And the dad started having all kinds of crazy uh, visions and things like that. And it would always happen. It, he'd always wake up at 3.15 in the morning. And he found out later that, you know, that's when the murders occurred. It was 3.15 in the morning. And all this crazy stuff. And they wrote a book about it. And it turns out that... I know this is going to be a shocker to everybody. 
none of it was true. Everybody, everybody gasps now. One, two, three. <gasps> okay. So, <clears throat> that's good. You guys did that well. All right. So, there was a priest involved. Uh, he's, he's noteworthy. He's worth talking about. Uh, the role of Father Picarado in the story had been given considerable attention. During the course of the lawsuit surrounding the case in the late 70s, Father Pecoraro Raro, stated in an affidavit that his only contact with the Lutzes concerning the matter had been by telephone. Remember, this was after the book came out. Other accounts said that Father Pecoraro did, let's just call him Father Pecker. I, I like that. <laughs> Uh, say that Father Pecker did visit the house but experienced nothing unusual there. Father Pecker gave what may have been his only on-camera interview about the recollections during a 1980s episode of In Search Of. You know, Leonard Nimoy, you remember that one? Uh, his face was obscured during the interview to pre preserve his anonymity. In the interview, he repeated the claim that he heard voices saying, Get out! but stopped short of giving it a paranormal origin. He also stated that he felt a slap on his face during the visit and that he did subsequently experience blistering on his hands. As with many areas of the Amityville horror, the inconsistent accounts given by Father Pecker about the extent of his involvement with the Lutz family had led to more questions than answers. So this guy's story changes every time he talks to somebody. And this guy's a priest, so, uh, you know, if you can't trust a priest to tell you the truth, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. And then there's more. Um, that's incredible. You remember that show? Interviewed him. Uh, or interviewed, or actually went and saw the house. And uh, they showed the red room, which was a small closet in the basement, and was known to the previous owners of the house because it was not concealed in any way. Uh, the claim made, made in chapter 11 of the book that the house was built on the site where local Shinnecock Indians had once abandoned the mentally ill and the dying was rejected by the local Native American leaders. The claim of cloven hoof prints in the snow on January 1st, 1976 was rejected by other researchers because it hadn't snowed that day. Um, let's see, where were we? Uh, neighbors reported nothing unusual during the time that the Lutzes were living there. Police officers were depicted visiting the house in the book in the 1979 film, but records show that the Lutzes never called the police during the period in question in which they were living on Ocean Avenue. There was no bar in Amityville called the Witch's Brew at the time, which is another factual error in the book. Uh, this whole paragraph's interesting. Of course, I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you, but it turns out that the lawyer that defended, and this is where it gets a little convoluted, but the lawyer that defended Ronald Defoe, the guy who, who axed his whole family, uh, got together with one of the psychic investigators that came and walked through the house after the murders and they sat around and started having uh, wine, you know, at the local bar with each other and dinner and discussing uh, what a cool book this would be. And they kind of wrote the book over dinner, uh, over several dinners. And lawsuits in ensued when certain people came out and said, you know, this is, this is bullshit. This is, this is not the way it happened. And other people were like, no, no, this is the way it happened. You can't tell me I'm lying in my book. So... All kinds of lawsuits and stuff like that. Uh, finally, you get down to the next highlighted section where, you know, some of these lawsuits are finally being dismissed. And you get something like, Judge Weinstein dismissed the Lutz's claim and observed in his ruling, this is quotes, based on what I've heard, it appears to me that to a large extent, the book is a work of fiction, relying in large part upon the suggestions of Mr. Weber. Mr. Weber was the lawyer that defended the axe murderer, or whatever he was. In the September 17, 1979 issue of People magazine, William Weber wrote, I know this book is a hoax. We created this horror story over many bottles of wine. 
This refers to the meeting that Weber is said to have had with George and Kathy Lutz, those are the people that moved into the house after the murders, during which they discussed what would later become the outline of Arson's book. So, and, and I, I will stop and make a comment on this because I had um, people that, uh, in my family that were sensitive and thought they had powers. Uh, I think this happens a lot when you start talking about paranormal things. I think you have a lot of people, alcohol may or may not always be involved. My, my family was full of teetotalers, Southern Baptist. But you have certain people that will get together and they will talk and they will say, hey, I saw this, and hey, I saw that. And the other one will go, yeah, and do you remember this? And they'll kind of feed off of each other and they will actually convince each other of lies. You know, they'll, they'll make the tail taller as they go. And the other one will go, yeah, it really did happen that way. Uh, and they'll sit there and they'll, and it's not that they're lying. Uh, that's, that's the insidious part of some of this, this type of thinking. They have actually convinced, I have a brother, and we'll talk about him a little bit more later. But they have actually woo-wooed themselves up into thinking that this really happened and this is really the truth. So when they come and tell the story to somebody else, they're telling it like, it like it's the truth. To the point that I imagine that they could probably even pass lie detector tests and things like that. I mean, they've literally rewired their brain in some cases into thinking this is what actually happened. Oh, and I guess we will get to the part now where we talk about my family and my brother and all of that. So... This is, this, is what, this is the best part of the thing I got to offer for you. When I was 14, I did see a ghost. Um, I was actually, you know, I was carpenter's aide. I was working on this, you know, old abandoned house out in the country, old, old abandoned farmhouse, that somebody had decided that they would uh, recondition and move into, you know, as a retirement house. And hobos had lived in there, you know, it was built in the 1920s, and, and some homeless people had moved in there and lived in there for a while and wrote some stuff on the walls. And, you know, it was, it was a nice house, and it kind of looked like the Amityville house. Um, you know, but it was in bad shape, so we did a lot of work on it. And, of course, it was in Memphis in the summer when it was 100 degrees in the shade, and we were reshingling the, the roofs. And, of course, you know, we'd, we'd do one row of roofs, and we'd get you know, about to where we pass out from the heat. And so me and my brother got this brilliant idea that we would run floodlights up on the roof of this old farmhouse. We had one circuit breaker, one power uh, lead from the, from the power company. We had temp power in. Uh, and so we'd run a bunch of extension cords and a bunch of floodlights up on the roof during the day. And we tested it out and all the lights came on and we go, this is cool. We're going to work on it at night when the sun's not beating down on us. This is going to be so much better. So we go home, and we come back out to this farmhouse. It's out in the country, you know, and it's, we come back out of the farmhouse at 11 o'clock, 12 at night, you know, after it's gotten cool. After the sun's gone, gone down, it's gotten cool. And we go over to the power box. We flip the breakers on. The roof slide up. We go, okay, this is awesome crawl up on the, on the roof and start nailing in shingles. We're maybe five minutes into this and circuit breaker clicks and all the lights go out. And now we have to crawl down these really steep old roofs, you know, to get back to the ladder and get back to the circuit breaker in the dark. And we think, well, that's kind of weird, but it's just a fluke. We reset the circuit breaker and we go back up on the roof, and this time about three minutes into nailing in shingles, circuit breaker pops, floodlights go off, we're left in the dark again. And we're like, okay, this is, this is weird. You know, so now we're starting to freak each other out a little bit. And so we go back down, we turn the lights on one more time, we wait, you know, what felt like a good 10, 15 minutes, and the lights stayed on. And then we get back up on the roof, and sure enough, they go out again. Almost just as soon as we get started again. So it's like, that's it, we're not doing this. So we turn the circuit breaker on, 
climb back down in the dark, turn the circuit breaker on, and we, you know, we've decided this is way before cell phones, so we decided that we're going to walk down the road and call my brother's wife and have her come out in the country and pick us up because we're done for the night. And uh, we get back around to the front of the house to pick up our tools or whatever, and I see in the front doorway a shadow of a man in a top hat just standing there. And of course, I freeze up, I turn white, my brother looks at me and he's like, what's going on? He turns around and he sees it. And he freaks out. And he starts to take off running. Now, I wasn't particularly brave when I was 14 years old. I don't know that I'm particularly brave right now, so I was just kind of frozen. And I couldn't do anything for just a couple of seconds, but in that couple of seconds, my higher brain kicked in and said, that's a really convincing shadow, but it hasn't moved, it hasn't spoke, it hasn't done anything in the last two or three seconds that I've been standing here staring at it. This has obviously got to be some sort of trick of light or something. And so I finally take a deep breath, I finally calm down a little bit, and I say, you know, what's going on here? You know, finally call my brother, who's nine years older than me, tell him to get his ass back up the, the road and come look at it with me and stop being such a wimp. And, uh, you know, what we had done is we had set a light bulb in the windowsill in the front of the house. There were stairs that led up to the second level right in the front door, and there was a, there was a, a banister that, you know, had the railing for the the stairwell, and it had this wonderful old crown molding on it. And this light was a single point of light, and it was casting this, sh this shadow of this banister up against the wall, up against the white wall, and it looked perfectly, that crown molding looked perfectly like a top hat across the top, a little brim, and then, you know, some eyes, a little eye socket, and a nose, and some lips, all cast against the wall. But it was just a light, and it was just a shadow. And it was nothing but our brains trying to assign pattern recognition to that crown molding on that wall. Now that should be the end of the story, right? But my brother went on for years telling that story like we saw a ghost in that old farmhouse. And every time I heard him say it, I would say, now buddy, remember, we figured out what was happening there. We didn't really see a ghost. But that's not as interesting of a story, is it? So, you know, a couple of years would go by, and I would hear him telling this ghost story to somebody else again and again and again, and I'd have to go, now, buddy, remember, yes, we were scared. Yes, we were freaked out. And I think that's, I think a, a lot of what these ghost hunter movies are all about, these guys that travel 500 miles and, you know, Go, go in a house and then practically pee themselves and run off. Uh, I, think, I think that's what happens in these ghost sightings is people, people get in this really, really agitated state and then they will believe anything when they're in that state. Whatever they see, whatever they hear, you know, whatever little movement comes across, it's suddenly being attributed to something, you know, scary and threatening and even supernatural when, if they could, and I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but if they could just calm down and see what was going on, they'd realize that it's perfectly explainable. So that's my ghost story, and that's how it ends. So now, let's see what else we got to talk about. We're still doing good on time, so astrology. Hopefully, nobody in this room really buys into astrology anymore. Um, I ganked a bunch of stuff off the internet, obviously. And um, it really boils down to the fact, like we discussed when I took astronomy back in 1986 or whenever it was, 
that if the premise here is that the stars and the position of the stars in the sky has some sort of effect on you when you're born and affects your personality, all it takes is a large garbage truck to you know, drive by the hospital at the moment of your birth and you're screwed up for life. Because the gravity from that garbage truck is going to have a greater pull on you than any star in the sky. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it, it's amazing that we would still have to talk about this. It's amazing that every major newspaper still carries, you know, an astrology section, uh, you know, here in 2014, but, but that's it. And as long as it's fun and people are having fun with it and nobody expects to be taken seriously, I guess I'm okay with it. But, you know, there is no force you know, that has to do with the stars in the sky or even where the Earth is on its orbit at any particular moment in time that's going to impact your personality. And it's damn sure not going to tell you how your day is going to go 30 years later, even if it did. Psychics! Psychics are great. I didn't do a lot of time uh, and research on psychics and I didn't need to. Most of this stuff came to me within a year of when I started doing paranormal talks and skeptics versus believers panels at the cons. People would get on my Facebook and say, hey, did you hear about this? You know. And sure enough, here we are. Um, you think psychics are never proven wrong? They're proven wrong constantly. That just doesn't make the news. Uh, and they're proven wrong even back in the late 70s uh, in this case on the on the right where you've got uh, Doris Stokes who was apparently a very very famous psychic in Great Britain uh, she and again uh, the reason I brought up the whole thing about people convincing themselves that they really have powers there was this uh, West Yorkshire Ripper this guy that was actually going around killing women serial killer at the time and she had gotten herself worked up to the point that she knew she thought she had psychic powers she knew she had psychic powers and she was talking to the police and the police were somehow feeding her you know and going yeah yeah you yeah, were convinced you really know what you're talking about and so she woke up one morning and she said the Yorkshire Ripper is going to be from this part of town he's going to going to probably live on this street and you know a few other things. I mean, we want to read the whole thing, we can. But <laughs> what it boiled down to is they went and they arrested this guy that happened to live on the street with the same name and in the same part, and in, in that part of town. And, you know, they threw this guy in jail and then started investigating his background and realized that he couldn't have committed about three quarters of the murders that had occurred. He had alibis for all of them. And she was completely debunked, you know, because she had worked herself up to the point. She'd broken the psychic's uh, first rule, which is not to be vague. And she gave a specific address in a specific part of town. So the cops go out and arrest some guy, some poor bloke, you know, who's just sitting in his house watching TV based on, you know, some name she's pulled out of her head. And, uh, you know, he spends a couple of days in jail while they go, uh, yeah, that's not him. Can't be him. You know, this was 1979. And uh, a more recent case was when Sylvia Brown, who is a celebrated psychic in this country, uh, got the smack down from Amanda Berry's mother because she told her she was dead years ago. It turns out, you know, that was one of those poor girls that that guy had locked up in his house for however many years it was. Uh, but Mama had written her off because Sylvia Brown had told her she was dead. She was talking to her on the other side. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. That was a lot of help. She literally got smacked over that. I'm glad she did. <clears throat> and just recently, in the last few months, with mediums, uh, we have several cases uh, Long Island Medium's a personal favorite of mine because I have family that, you know, thinks she's wonderful. Uh, she went to one of her shows and she started doing these cold readings 
like John Edwards does. And she just missed, just, you know, random chance. Normally, you'd, you'd get it right every once in a while, and she was just missing on everything. And ends up the crowd leaves completely disappointed, disheartened because she couldn't get anything right. Uh, let's see. She seemed off on almost every reading, and it was like pulling teeth to match up info. She was really grasping at straws and did a lot of fishing. One disappointed audience member, audience member at the April 5th reading recently complained to Ticketmaster.com. For the most part, readings were forced and uninspired. Well, that's all they ever are. And then there's another one just like it. And again, this all happened in uh, May. Dateline on the one is May. The other one's r roughly around the same time frame, April. So this has all happened in the last six months. Uh, celebrity psychic left red face after summoning a live audience member. Somebody actually did it. You know, we always make the joke, I'm going to go to John Edwards or I'm going to go to whoever and I'm going to, I'm going to have him summon my dead wife and then say, well, this is, my, this is my wife right here sitting beside me. Somebody actually did it. Somebody in the UK actually said, okay, uh, you know, I want to talk to my father. And she goes, okay, well, your father says that, you know, he's in a better place and he's, he's happy and you should be happy. And then she turns around, she goes, this is my father right here. So, uh, you know, what can we say about mediums other than they're full of it? And yes, there have been moments where people have literally proven that they're full of it. And it happens all the time. So, fortune tellers. I bet everybody's wondering what I'm going to say about fortune tellers now, huh? Again, you know, a little bit of research. And what do you come up with? Well, I found this book written in 1938 by a policewoman, a detective. And I thought it was interesting that there was a police detective running around New York in 1938. But her job was to just go and talk to fortune tellers and expose them as frauds and put them in jail. That was her whole career. And, she, and at the end of her career, she wrote a book about it. And, you know, she's got, there's some great, great quotes in here as well, but it basically boils down to the fact that, you know, she's saying things like, as many fortune tellers as I've been to and as many readings as I've had, I ought to be the one woman on the planet that knows more about our future than anybody. And I don't. I, I can't tell you anything more about what my future is going to hold than anybody else. Um, so... If you're really into that and you really think there's uh, something to be garnered from that, uh, you know, I would certainly go back and read that book uh, as a starting point. And, it, and, and the thing that struck me again when I was researching this is, is this all, all this stuff happened back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. You know, this stuff should have been put to bed a long time ago. And... It kind of was, I think, in the 50s and 60s, and then somewhere along the way, people got interested in it. It's just, it's interesting, you know, to go to a fortune teller or to talk to a psychic, you know, about your dead grandmother and have her tell you how wonderful it is, you know, in heaven where she is now or whatever. Uh, it makes for an interesting night, but that's all it does. You know, it, it's, it's not real. So I also went and back when this was a big fad, the magnetic wrist and things like that, I actually went and talked to some of these folks that were hawking magnets, uh, which of course is near and dear to my heart since now we're talking about physics and things that I know something about. And so I went in to see just what this guy was going to say to me you know, with all this magnet therapy and stuff like that, and it was, it was amazing, the level of ignorance that was, was being touted there. The guy would put a magnetic wrist on my hand, and he'd say, now, this is how you know it's working, and he'd put a coil and a light, you know, just a, a few feet from my hand, and he'd say, now, wiggle your hand back and forth, because it only works when you're, you know, when you're moving. You've got to be moving, you know, but if you're exercising and moving, it's going to do wonders for you. And I said, I do this. Sure enough, the light comes on. Well, that's nothing more than current induction, you know, 
from a ma from a permanent magnet. It happens all the time. It's called a generator. It's how we get power in here, you know, so that I can sit up here and talk to you. It's been well understood, and it's got nothing to do with, you know, making you stronger or making the blood in your body pump better or anything like that. Um, there was a quote I had in here. I did not highlight it, but it was cute because it was talking about the, the NMR machines or MRI machines that they used in the hospitals. They, they used to be called nuclear magnetic resonance, then nuclear became a bad word, so they made it MRI. It's the same machine. But basically, it's like the astronomy thing. If you could change the way your blood flowed or improve the hemoglobin in your blood or the iron in your blood by wearing a magnetic bracelet, you know, and, and again, the theory is, is that the magnets pull the iron out of your blood into the places you need it most, and that kind of thing. If that were to literally happen, then when you got in an MRI machine, it would rip all the blood vessels out of your body because that magnet's about 20,000 times stronger. And so it would, if you had enough iron in your blood to be impacted by, you know, a wrist magnet, then it would literally pull all of the blood out of your veins when you got in an MRI machine. So we're getting near the end and I deliberately ran ahead just a bit in case we had questions and we wanted to talk about something in particular. But this is probably the best proof in trying to prove a negative that I can provide. I have now been doing this for three or four years at this point. And I have talked to some of these psychics, some of these ghost hunters, some of these mediums, some of them right here at Dragon Con. And I have said, look, guys, I'm a scientist. You know, and they've, they've made comments like, uh, you know, it, w nobody takes us seriously. We just can't get accepted by the scientific community. So here's what I offer. Here's what I bring to the table in this, in this particular discourse. Is I say, look, guys, I'm a scientist. If you prove me, if you prove to me that you see something that's paranormal, something that's different, something that can't be explained already by what science knows, I will be your best defender. I will go. I will document it. I will write the papers. I will talk to the scientific community. I will do everything for you as an accepted scientist if, if all you really need is acceptance. And so I have all of these business cards that I had printed up when I was between jobs. And I started handing them out about three years ago to all these psychics, and to all these, all these investigators. And I said, if you find anything, I will get in the car. I don't care if it's in Charlotte. I don't care if it's in Atlanta. I'll get in the car and I'll spend the night in a haunted house with you, whatever. You got something you can show me, I'll go with you. Anybody want to guess how many people have taken me up on the offer? Zero. Zero is absolutely correct. It's not hard to count. It has never happened. You know, and, and I've been asked things like, well, what if it's just a cold spot in the room that you can't explain or something like that? And I've said, yeah, yeah. If it's anything, if you really do think that it's something that doesn't have a legitimate explanation, then I will go and investigate it with you. And if I can't explain it, we'll start talking about it. And nobody has answered that challenge. So what other conclusion should I draw other than the one that I have, which is that it's all, it's all bunk? And then there's a little uh, extra slide that I threw in there about James Randi, who's been offering a million dollars for God knows how long. Uh, you know, I'd say at least 20 years. Uh, he upped the prize. I think it started, you know, at 150 or 200 thousand. You know, back in in the 80s when 150 thousand dollars was still real money. But he's now up to a million dollars on his challenge. That if anybody can show him, you know, some sort of psychic ability, Ben Spoons, whatever, and he can't disprove it. He'll write you a million dollar check. The trick, and the thing about James Randi is, is he's an ex-magician. So he knows all the, how all the parlor tricks are done. 
And sure enough, if he started in the 80s, what's it been, 40 years? Yeah, probably closer to 40 years now. Nobody's gotten a check from him yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, conclusions. You know, the sad thing for me is that most of this stuff is so easily is debunked with just a little research. You know, it's, it's sad because so many people believe it, and if they believed it, you would think they would take five minutes in, in this day of the Internet and Google to actually go and, and take the skeptic's point of view and see what other people have to say about it, and they obviously don't. Or if they do, they don't believe what they're hearing. I didn't cherry pick any of the examples used in this presentation. I simply started with topics that jumped out at me as interesting and followed up with just a little bit of digging. Uh, even with the burden of proving a negative, the job didn't seem to be all that hard. Uh, there's a great deal of misinformation in the world. In the end, most people just believe the things they want to believe. And that's the sad thing. We probably all need to learn to think a little bit more critically. So with that, I added this cute little, little uh, meme at the top where it says, Life is hard. It's harder if you're stupid. John Wayne. It's got a nice little picture of John Wayne. And then, uh, I don't know, something just, just hit me kind of funny when I, when I put that meme on there. And, it, and I found this. That line is from the 1973 film The Friends of Eddie Coyle. The star of the film is Robert Mitchum. And he didn't deliver this line. Some bit character delivered the line. John Wayne wasn't even in it. So we all. The go. Anyway, yeah, hey, look, it's a short in the mic. Oh, geez, it's not a ghost. I should have just. Should have just said it was a ghost and been happy. But. Um, yeah, maybe the ghost calls it short. That's it. Uh, you know, so we all believe the stuff we want to believe. You know, I was perfectly happy thinking that John Wayne said that. Sure enough, he hadn't. And that's it. I will take questions at this point. Uh, I've actually got us down to three minutes just from ranting and raving. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll sit here and look at you for three minutes and maybe do a little dance or, or we can just call it a day. Yes, sir. If you would step up to the mic, that'd be great. That way they can get it on the... Uh, uh, deceive you and fake something that you then be bunt. You know, that's the thing. is I, te I do tend to believe, in spite of the fact that I sound so skeptical, I do tend to believe that most people are good and honest people. And no, no one has ever tried to pull the wool over my eyes. Uh, nobody's been dumb enough to try that because I might actually smack them upside the head if they were going to do that. Um, so no, I can honestly say that. I can give them props for that. Yes, ma'am. What's your take on auras and like people's ability to see auras? That's two questions. <laughs> it's combined. <laughs> I mean, I've seen the the is it, is it called the cuneiform lighting where they actually can, can put your hand in an electric field, a film that's got an electric field on it, and you can actually see the sparks, you know, that's coming out of your energized skin into the grounded film? Uh, so I know that that's a real thing. Uh, and again, I don't think there's anything mystical about that. Uh, you know, I, I think that's just basic electronics, uh, basic electricity even. So, do you have some kind of an aura under those circumstances? You know, when you're hooked up to a 20,000 volt generator, low, low current generator, and you're putting it on a grounded piece of, putting your hand on a grounded piece of film? Yeah, you've got an aura in that sense. Um, I have to say that if somebody is actually walking around seeing auras, I, I can't imagine how that could work in terms of wavelength of light, uh, thermal radiation, nothing I understand in physics would, would explain that. And it seems like 
like with the psychics, most people that think they see auras are probably a little self-deluded. Uh, so, no, I don't think anybody can see auras, and I don't know that we've really got any auras in the sense that, you know, if I'm on an old, crusty, 50-year-old guy, I've got a red aura, and if I'm a happy young person, then I've got a blue aura or some kind of crap like that. I just, I don't see any explanation for that.